Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter number one, and we're going to um, go here where we, I'm not exactly sure where we were last time, and uh, so we're just going to go back and, and uh, in essence, uh, go through some of this uh, a little bit, I don't know, maybe a little bit quicker in some of these areas. What we've seen to this point is that God has uh, created, uh, all of creation was, was designed to bring honor and glory to God. In many regards, we would say that man has a very unique responsibility to uh, come along and glorify God. Man's creation, we saw, was unique. Only man was uh, made in the image of God. Uh, As such, they bore God's resemblance. This was God's intent. Uh, Man has a unique responsibility as well. Uh, The responsibility is for uh, man to come along and glorify God. That's why you and I are here. We do well to ponder 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, whether it is the most basic things of life or whether it is what we might term as the uh, more important or uh, whatever things of life, everything that you and I do is ultimately designed to bring honor and glory to him. The problem was that sin entered the world and sin had a very adverse effect on man. As soon as sin entered the world, we find that there was death that entered the world. This was never God's intent. Death was the result of sin. Adam and Eve uh, chose to disregard God's command. They ate of the fruit of the tree, and all mankind was plunged into sin. Adam and Eve also experienced severed fellowship with God. Uh, Things were no longer the same. At one point in time, they had uh, enjoyed a fellowship with God, but that was no longer the case. And then they experienced an altered relationship as well. They were forced from the Garden of Eden and were never allowed to uh, return back there as well. What we begin to see is that sin has played a very negative effect on things. And let me uh, remind you that you today are a sinner. Uh, If you don't believe that, take a look back over this last week. You probably did something wrong. All right. Uh, this should not be uh, something that is debated. Some say, well, well, no, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, then you probably didn't live last week. I don't know how else to say it. I uh, say, so well, you could live in your house and, and isolate yourself and you're still going to do wrong. You're still going to think things that are wrong. And, and that's just that's who we are. The sin problem uh, results in uh, physical death, but more importantly, it results in spiritual death. The reality is that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they were dead as far as God was concerned. There was a, uh, an aspect where uh, all of a sudden the spiritual death was immediate. The physical death still took place later on. The Bible describes the lost individual as those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. Just as you would be well aware, a dead individual is incapable of doing anything. Uh, We are incapable then of saving ourselves, but God intervened and God created this plan of redemption that is described in Ephesians chapter number one and verse number four. It is, or I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter one. What we began to see last time is that this plan was detailed in Ephesians chapter 1 in the first 14 verses. It was a plan that includes all the members of the Godhead. We've already seen, according to verse number 4, that God has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world was ever created, before the foundations of the world. In other words, God's plan of redemption was not a last minute reaction to man's choice to sin, it was the result of something that that had already been planned before the world had ever been created, before sin had entered into the world. We see in this phrase that is repeated, or at least a similar phrase that is repeated, verse number uh, 6 says, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Uh, Verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory. Verse number 14, at the end of it, unto the praise of His glory. Each of these phrases uh, provide us with a little bit of a different section. And each member of the Godhead then is described. And so in verses 4 through 6, you find that God the Father ultimately planned salvation. 
According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted and beloved. God's uh, plan, God the Father is responsible for the plan of it. And then we saw in verses 7 through 11, or 7 through 12, that God the Son executed it. In other words, God the Son is the one responsible for uh, putting this plan into action in whom, meaning in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Jesus Christ has provided the means through his death on the cross for you and I to have that sin forgiven. God does not look at us and declare us to be innocent. That would be uh, an incorrect statement. God looks at us and declares us to be righteous. He forgives us. In forgiving us, he takes that sin and he completely removes it, the Bible teaches, as far as the east is from the west. The law, as we will study in Galatians chapter 3 this morning, has a standard that demands perfection. You and I are incapable of meeting that perfection. God says, all right, fine. If you feel that you're going to be able to earn your way to heaven, then you're going to have to function absolutely perfectly every single day. But that's not the case, and no one is capable of doing that. The result is sin. As soon as sin enters into the world, there's a standard that God has that we are incapable of meeting. Man falls short of that standard. That's what Romans chapter number 3 teaches. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here's God's standard. Here's man at his best. There's nothing we can do to bridge this gap. God sent Jesus Christ to live a sinless life. In doing so, he satisfied all the demands of the law. He did live a perfect life. He therefore was able to take the punishment that you and I deserve. He himself bore it on the cross. That's what salvation is all about. I deserve that death. I deserve eternal life. I deserve rather eternal death. That's my lot as a sinner. But God in his love sent his son so that you and I could have eternal life. Jesus Christ took my place on the cross. And when I place my trust in him and call out to him in faith, God's word teaches that I am saved. Salvation does not achieve by works. You can't earn your way there. You can't be good enough because it demands perfection. That's saying you're not a good person, but I am saying you're not good enough. Okay? Uh, you are not a perfect one. Those of us who have placed our trust in Christ are able to look back and say to God be the glory. Our sins have been forgiven. God has removed those things as far as the east is from the west. And when those things are brought back up in, reminding, or in remembrance, it's not God who's doing it. God's already forgiven it. Don't live in the past of defeat. God's forgiven that. Move on and enjoy the freedom that truly is there uh, for Christ. God the Son executed it. And then we find in verses 13 and 14 that God the Holy Spirit sealed it. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This seal was something that was done as a mark of ownership. It would oftentimes be done uh, by a, uh, a Roman king or a Roman emperor, uh, and he would take a seal, often dip it in some sort of hot wax, and he would seal a document with his ring. This would indicate this was a genuine document. It was something that the ownership of it could not be uh, disputed in any way. Here's the reality. As you and I, the moment that we got saved, we were given the Holy Spirit. He indwells within us. That fact says we belong to Him. Amen. And what a wonderful truth. <laughs> uh, the Old Testament had a, and I know we often think, oh man, you know, I wonder what it would have been like to live back in Moses' day. And we think all these things. You know, I've got the Holy Spirit who's promised never to leave me or forsake me. Uh, in many ways, I've got it a lot better. But nonetheless, uh, the Holy Spirit was uh, there and uh, he comes and, and indwells in me and says that this person belongs to God and will for all of eternity. That's your position if you are saved. 
If you are not saved today, you do not have the Holy Spirit residing in you. You will not have the desire for the things of God. You will not have the desire to do that which is pleasing before him. You don't belong to him. The Bible teaches that those who are unsaved are of their father, the devil. He is the one, unfortunately, to whom they belong. And can I say, he's a very cruel taskmaster. The Bible also describes the Holy Spirit in verse number 14 as the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, he is the down payment of our inheritance. If you've ever purchased a car or purchased a home, you are aware that uh, the place from which you are purchasing it or the bank requires a down payment to be made. Uh, if you uh, have done real estate, you're familiar with the term earnest money. Uh, if you have never done anything with real estate and people start talking about earnest money, realize that that is money you will not get back. <laughs> uh, you might choose to bail out of that particular uh, deal and you lose that money. Someone learned that lesson via $10,000, okay? Uh, that's an expensive way to learn what earnest money is, all right? Uh, but earnest money says... It's a down payment, and what it does is it is, in the business world, it is something that is saying, uh, I am uh, pursuing this with great interest, and I'm willing to, in essence, put my money where my mouth is, and we will finish this degree. Now, in our business world, or in a real estate world, that deal may fall through. Uh, we may be out that money, and you will be out that money, but when it comes spiritually speaking, God the Father has given us the Holy Spirit, in essence, as the down payment of a future inheritance that we can rest assured will, in fact, be ours. There's no way that this deal is falling through. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6 teaches us that uh, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God the Father is going to finish that work which he has begun, and the Holy Spirit is a guarantee that this is, in fact, going to take place. You will receive this inheritance. It is described in uh, the book of Peter as an inheritance that is incorrupted, undefiled, that fadeth not away, one that is reserved in heaven for you. It's not going anywhere. And the Bible uses the term hope to describe this, but it's not hope in the sense that there is some degree of uncertainty. It is hope in the sense that this is a confident expectation that I have as a child of God. This is what awaits me for all of eternity. You know, when I go through life and I go through all of the challenges of life, I have a settled assurance in my heart and in my mind that I am a child of God. That nothing that I go through is ever going to in any way take me out of his arms. I, I can't lose my salvation. I will never be separated from his love. I will never be separated from his presence. He is always there. That's how we get through the difficult times of life. How do unsaved people get through them? I honestly don't know. I know the areas in which they turn. I know the things for which they look. They try to find the hope and they try to find the peace. They try to find all of these things. It's not there if they aren't finding it in Jesus Christ. But I will say this, that those whose hope is truly found in Jesus Christ are able to endure the most difficult and most unbelievably challenging circumstances imaginable. I was speaking with uh, Cheryl just before the service, and uh, she commented that Danny's faith through all of this has never once wavered. It's amazing. Why? Because his hope is not found in circumstances. His hope is not found in his bank account. His hope is not found in earthly relationships. As precious as they are, his hope is found in Jesus Christ alone. That's the key for salvation. And there are people today who struggle through life with all sorts of uncertainty. They struggle from trial to trial to trial and adversity. Nothing seems to go right. Why? What is God trying to do? It may very well be that God is using these circumstances as difficult as they are to draw you to himself. Many of you have testified 
that you were saved later on in life. Most who have given that testimony, as I look amongst us here, have also added to the fact that God brought you to a pretty low point in your life before you were finally willing to look up to him. Most times, people are not at the height of their life when they look up to God. God's oftentimes brought them through some very difficult times. What's God trying to do in your life? Maybe God's working. Maybe God's answering the prayers of those who have been praying for your salvation. And he's answering those prayers by making your life challenging. (laughs) God does those things. But let me tell you, when you look to him for salvation, it is the greatest thing that will ever take place. There will be no greater gift. And then we can go through life knowing, as 1 John chapter 5 teaches, that we have eternal life. It's not something that I look at and say, well, you know, I, I hope I, I'm able to have eternal life. I, I hope I'm saved. I hope when it's all said and done that I end up on the right side. I, I don't have that uncertainty in the least bit. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I died today, exactly where I would go. You will never talk me out of it. You will never persuade me differently. It's impossible. I know that I am saved. Do you have that kind of assurance today? If not, I want to beg you as much as I can to make that a matter that you settle today because it is far too important. Eternity depends on it. We find that this plan of redemption is Uh, detailed uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, but we also find that this plan is achieved through faith. Um, This is an aspect that oftentimes we um, may not necessarily uh, put a focus on. Let me back up from this. God's plan was to restore man's ability ultimately to glorify God. He was created, his plan was, according to verse number 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. His plan was, according to verse 12, so that we might be to the praise of his glory. But I want to point out, verse number 14, that the completed product will be to the praise of his glory. You see the difference? God's plan was that we would be to the praise of his glory. God's Uh, plan was, uh, or God's plan was to the glory of his grace. God's plan was so that we might be to the praise of his glory. But when it's all said and done, I can assure you, according to the end of verse 14, that the purchased possession will be to the praise of his glory. How is man able to glorify God? Because of salvation. If there were no salvation, there would be no means to glorify God. Isaiah describes our righteousness as as nothing more than filthy rags. Those things that we think are good, God looks at and says, no, they, they are of no value. They are as nothing more than filthy rags. That's God's perspective on it. It's amazing how we look at it. We look at it and say, well, this is my crowning work. This is gold. This is silver. This is whatever it is. And God looks at that for the unsaved person. He says, no, this is absolutely nothing. There's no righteousness here. Why? Because it is not something that is able to be earned. It is something, as we'll now see, that is achieved only through faith. That's it. There is no other way of achieving this. Let's go to a couple of different passages. Let's go to John chapter number 3. A conversation takes place between Jesus and a man by the name of Nicodemus. This man was a a member of the religious uh, group known as the Sanhedrin. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was very familiar with uh, the word of God, very familiar with all the claims of it, very familiar with uh, what he was to do as a Jew, but he was still lacking in something. And so he came to Jesus, and he says in verse number 2, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except that thou, uh, that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's amazing to me how Nicodemus approaches him and how Jesus responds to him. 
We know that, that you must be a teacher who was sent by God because no one can do these things except God be with him. And Jesus never even really addresses that. But he tells him his greatest need. The words, verily, verily, we might say most assuredly. We would say this is something that is extremely important. Of everything else, this is what demands our attention. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was quite puzzled by that. How in the world are we supposed to be born again? <laughs> Can a man enter the his mother's womb a second time and be born? And all ladies say, thank God, no. <laughs> okay, uh, that's not possible. So how in the world can we be born again? He explains it in verse number six. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There are two births. There's the physical birth. All of you have had that. I can testify to that. Though some of you look a little dead today, but that's okay, all right? Uh, you are still present. I can tell that you were physically born, but what I cannot tell is are you spiritually born? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there is one person in here who is. That's me. <laughs> Not you. That's me. You're sitting there saying, well, there's one person in here, and that's me. Not you, okay? That's all right if you can say it with that kind of confidence. But if you can't, you need to get that matter settled. Let's go to another passage, John chapter 14. John 14, Jesus is announcing to his disciples that he is about to depart from them. And of course, they immediately uh, were very troubled by that. And he explained to them that um, he will come again. He explained to them that he would go and prepare a place for them, that he'll come again, receive them. Uh, and then he says in verse 4, Whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Um, where I'm going, you know, and you know how to get there. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord... We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how in the world can we know the way? Notice this answer, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. The way removes this way from all other ways. Okay? Not a way. There are lots of ways that we could get to Charlotte. Right? You could go some very indirect routes to Charlotte. There are lots of ways you can get there. But if we said there's only one way to get to a certain location, that's it. It removes that path from all other paths. The world would have you believe that as long as you're good, all these roads lead to the same place. All but one lead to the same place. It's eternity in hell. Only one is separate from that. I am the way. I am the truth. There is, uh, as opposed to any kind of deceit, there, he is the embodiment of truth. I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, there is absolutely no single individual who will ever get to the Father except coming through Jesus Christ. You will not break God's ordained order. There are no exceptions to this. Only through Jesus Christ. In other words, only as we've already said, by placing our trust in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. That's it. You cannot get there any other way. I was driving the other day, and I was given an address to go to Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, got, I don't know, I was probably, if you've not been to Louisville, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky is a long way away from here. And uh, so I was within 30 minutes probably or so of getting to Louisville, and, and I'm, I'm ready to just be done. I'm ready to be out of the seat for a little while. And, and I get a question that I, was, I never like, and, and the question is, what address do you have? <laughs> I was like, well, this is the one I have. No, that's not it. Uh, okay, well, what is it? Well, you can probably go to the next, next road and turn around. And I said, what? <laughs> and I said it just like that. 
turn around. I said, is it close to Louisville? No. I'm like, my goodness, you know, you're a preacher, you're a Christian, no, don't think these thoughts, but my goodness, Lord, I don't want to turn around. Uh, how, how long? It's, and it's like, it's probably 45 minutes back. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I said, so, well, do you have an address? Well, we're going to chase it now. I have no idea where I'm going, and I don't, I don't like that feeling at all, by the way, not at all. And um, so uh, he starts putting it in, he texts some people and starts putting it in a phone, and, and now all I'm doing is relying on a passenger with Google Maps on his phone, not having a clue where he is, not having a clue what the vehicle is capable of, the roads it's capable of being on, and I'm listening to his directions. And it's not a pleasant thing at all. So we begin going down this road and we start taking country roads which are typically concerning <laughs> and uh, they're nice wide roads and and uh, beautiful beautiful horse farms if you've been in Lexington Kentucky and and uh, these are the the farms that uh, often Kentucky Derby level horses I mean just absolutely unreal and I'm just looking at these farms thinking my goodness their gates worth more than my house okay and I'm serious I mean we're talking stonework and unbelievable gates and I'm like wow this is incredible and all of a sudden it goes down to a really, really narrow road. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. And we kept, and we kept going. Well, I, I don't turn on this next road. Just keep on going straight. And GPS was telling me to turn. Okay, well, I keep going straight. Well, then the white line disappeared. I'm like, oh, this is really not a good road to be on. And then there's that infamous sign, no trucks beyond this point, which... So now we're turning around on these narrow roads. We finally get to our destination, and I... I'm sitting there, and I called our dispatcher, and, and because I, I was having to have another driver meet me, and uh, I called my dispatcher, and I said, listen, I haven't looked on my phone or my computer yet, but I said, I'm going to tell you, I have no idea where I am right now, except that I can see a water tower that says Wilmore, Kentucky. You all know where Wilmore, Kentucky is? Neither do I. I do now. I do very well now. You know what his words were? He said, are you serious? He said, I got family there. He said, you can't get there from here. And I said, yeah, tell me about it. Uh, so then he said, I got family there. And I told him the road I came down. He said, we don't even run our cars down that road. So then there's another bus driver who comes over, and I'm talking to him, and, and uh, he said, uh, he made the same comment. He said, I told him I need to get, I said, I got to get back to I-75 South. He said, you can't get there from here. He's like, yeah, that's what I've been told. And he said, well, how did you get here? And I told him, he said, oh, my goodness. He said, I don't even take my pickup truck down that road. And I said, well, let me tell you, if you need to take a bus down that road, you can. It is not recommended, however. There's definitely no way for that. But to me, I'm looking at a place that says, you can't get there from here. Well, I got there. Okay. Did I have a clue where I was? No. There was a water tower that said Wilmore. I knew I was in the state of Kentucky, okay? That's all I knew. I had no idea where I was in relation to anything except a lacrosse field, and it was to my right. That is all I knew. I had no idea how I got there. I, no, it sure didn't seem well. It didn't seem like a very smooth route to get there. I knew I was late. I knew I didn't get to the, or didn't, wasn't going to the right destination. There was a lot about that trip I didn't know. There's a lot of people today who are going through life on roads that they don't know. And they haven't got a clue where they're going. I don't necessarily know every road I'm going to travel in life. But I know where I'm going to end. There's no uncertainty. You see, I had the wrong address. And I was going to the wrong location. Kind of amazing when I had the right address. I ended up at the right spot. There are a lot of individuals who are programmed with the wrong address. And they're going to get to the wrong place. Oh, I thought I was taking them to the right lacrosse field. Never once did I set out and say, well, you know what? I am going to go the wrong direction this trip. But I did discover that I was. You know what I needed to do? Turn around and get back where I needed to be. 
spiritually speaking. Where's the road that you are on going to lead? It will lead somewhere. The world says all roads lead to the same place. God's word says that's not the case. All roads but one lead to the same place. Eternity in hell. There's only one that leads to eternity in heaven. I was told, sitting on a bus, you can't get there from here. But I can tell you as a pastor, you can get there from here. And it's through Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who has provided redemption for us. It's achieved through faith. That's it. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. What a wonderful truth that is taught in the word of God. We'll see this next time that this results in a total transformation. Your life will never be the same from that moment. The most important question you will ever answer is this. Where are you going to spend in eternity. If you're uncertain, you need to get it settled today because the uncertainty most likely suggests there isn't salvation. I can stand here confidently with where I'm going. Many of you can as well. If you believe you can earn your way there, you are wrong. You've got the wrong address. And you're going to get to the wrong destination. You're following the wrong advice. But it's going to have eternal ramifications. Me, I was 45 minutes late. Not my problem, honestly. I did what I was told to do. What a tragedy for someone to find out that it was eternally the wrong decision. That's what will happen if you don't place your trust in Jesus Christ.